So this week we're really excited to have Paul Chapman with us. Oliver is founder, director, and architect at Oliver Chapman Architects. We're based in Edinburgh's Old Town. Practice both abroad, hosts a broad range of work from furniture through to larger scale residential. Last year, the practice was given the title of Scottish Architectural Practice of the Year 2020, and their project, the Edge, was recently the winner of five awards, two of which included the RIDA National Award and the RAS Regional Award. Thank you. I'll pass over to you. That's how Thank you. Yes, I think we've worn them down so many annual applications for architecture practice of the year that <laughs> finally gave in. Um, really nice to be at an event like this face to face. This is such a treat for me. Can you hear me okay? I'm just checking. Great. Someone join in. Um, yeah, I, I put this talk, talk together for you. It's a selection of projects and I, I would like, I'm trying to make it not just a series of projects with no connection. And I, and I've noticed from our practices work over the years, uh, we have a number of small projects and we're very proud of them. And I was just reflecting on, on them. Um, uh, I thought I would start by just saying, I think, we're very privileged as architects in many ways. And one is that we get to play with other people's uh, budgets and all sorts of things, but um, we we get to play with scale. Uh, and I think um, that in that way, we're, we're kind of like a, a bit of an illusionist. If we can master, if we can master scale, uh, then um, if we can understand it, and then we can have some great fun with scale. Um, so I'm sort of um, irreverent, and I think I think I think playing with small buildings allows you to be um, a little bit irreverent, and small projects can slip under the radar that bit easier. And just because it's a small in scale project doesn't mean it's not big on ambition. Um, and you can still have just as big a narrative as a as a large master plan. Um, so I just want to convert, and if you want an ethical argument for, for the value of smallness, um, I think there'd be a great lecture to have about that. And I'd point you to uh, Patrick Schumacher, the, an economist um, and educator from the mid 20th century. Patrick Schumacher, Small is Beautiful. It's a great book about uh, small economies and local economies. Um, and if you're not a great, book reader there's a half hour radio podcast if you google that um you can it's a great uh story there uh small is beautiful patrick schumacher um but i i'm not so much going to talk about the ethical argument for, for smallness it was more just i want to convey my enjoyment of the playfulness you can have working at a small scale um so I'm going to show you uh, some projects by one or two projects by others that I find particularly enlightening and fun. I'm going to show you some projects, one project we've designed that never actually happened. So it's a, it's a, it's a mixture. Um, and that's, there's no false modesty here. I'm, I'm I, I do, we do uh, uh, like to have our projects to have an impact. Uh, the impact for our clients, especially when there's a, a community-led development project or something like that. Um, but um, uh, I'm going to show you these projects which um, generally fall into the small category, let's say. Of course, small is daft to say, even a piece of furniture is large to a, a jewellery maker or someone like that, some other craft design discipline. But uh, for us as architects, perhaps we consider um, the furniture to perhaps uh, be small and there's one project like that I'm going to show you. We're a relatively small team I think we're with three architects and a part two um, architectural assistant and we're based in Edinburgh. Right. So I, I just a couple of examples of architect, other architects who played with scale that illusion of a building that appears, this one is a building that appears large, but is actually composed of multiple apartments. This, 
this, this desire to create the illusion of a single building um, uh, to give the impression that it's called a palace front of a building in Edinburgh, uh, uh, just off uh, Leith Tottenham and Leith Walk near Gayfield Square on the, on, the, on the left of the image, um, to create that the, uh, the commodity, the sense of value for uh, to convince the, 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 uh, those with land outside Edinburgh to come and take an apartment in the city centre, that they could still be living in a, in a, in a house and a single building that has a sense of grandeur. And um, as contemporary with that, I just want to show you another similar idea by William Chambers, a sort of a Georgian architect, uh, born to Scottish parents, but uh, born in Sweden. Um, and he traveled to China and uh, studied Chinese architecture and studied in Italy and Rome, uh, so Italy and France, and uh, and, his, yeah. and this project is in Ireland. So quite a traveled global figure of person. Um, and this project in is called the Casino at Marino. So a casino is a like casa, it's a diminutive form of the word casa, casino. And of course we know it in a slightly different context, of course, for, uh, for gambling. But I think back then it was uh, just a small house. Uh, and it is a folly it, in, in the grounds of a large house uh, that appears to be a single roomed structure, um, but uh, Chambers was quite careful to um, as playful with this as an illusion. So within it are actually sixteen rooms on three floors, and the uh, Chambers is is kind of careful to detail those those, those pa panel doors such that, that it opens like shutter like. Uh, into the central room, the window on the gables, or the, the single window on the in the porticos on the gables are curved, so it reflects back at you rather than you seeing the, the window up against the back of the glass. So, so an architect that is is really enjoying the way of creating that illusion of scale, to create something that looks small but is actually complex. And his playful, he got, he, he, this, is, this is the same architect that designed the, um, the pineapple house in the wall garden that's um, near Earth, which is um, Dunmore, is it? Um, do you know um, that uh, celebration of the exotic, being able to grow exotic fruit in a Scottish garden um, using heating the wall? It's completely bonkers to, to cut the wood down from the estate and burn it uh, to heat the garden walls so that one could grow a, a ripen apricots if not if not pineapples so our, I, I've spoke I remember I spoke about this I've, I'm just going to skip through this project because I've spoken to students here at RGU for a long time ago about this project we, uh, but I still like to touch on it. We call it bed box, uh, and um, that is it on the on the left. And a uh, reference, one of a number of references. This is this is when we started up in architect in our practice about twenty years ago, uh, and seeing a a nice. Um, this is a was labelled the Shetland chair. You might, you'll, of course, know the Orkney chair variety. This sort of vernacular furniture from from the, the, the uh, from, from Shetland and Orkney, uh, and the idea of an uh, enclosure. Even a piece of furniture can give you a sense of enclosure. Um, uh, this sort of hooded back, and uh, it's got a nice inverted space underneath. Uh, this is definitely a patriarchal chair. Uh, and, uh, and it's a place where the family Bible might have been stored underneath the seat. Uh, and, um, but that, that uh, hood space, is, is it there to protect you from the drafts in the croft it makes me, me, in the house? It makes me wonder. But of course, from the very austere uh, chair on the, on, the, on the right to the decadence of Louis XIV, who who would um, receive guests whilst lying in bed. Um, common, I think to the Romans that wasn't also wasn't un, 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 uncommon. 
And then other references, peculiar references here, is um, my favourite architect, one of mine, Adolf Loos, uh, sort of weird look into his men into his psychology of Adolf Loos in a, I mean, a Freudian way. This is Loos, this is family, this is his the bedroom, his own bedroom. And instead of it being uh, uh, for the, the sort of timber veneers and hard harder surfaces, he's they've got this very lush um, bed space. Um, and then other the Saint Jerome translating the Bible there in Antonella de Messina, 15th century painting, Flemish style, um, where Saint Jerome is at the center of his universe within the sort of uh, within the sort of sanctuary of this community of the, the monastery, the, the view beyond. And this this is a love, this is a classic architect architectural reference, isn't it? Of a, or individual space within the, the collective. And all these references we wanted to bubble down into our structure for just for a bed <laughs> and a seat. Uh, and this is us drawing 20, was me drawing 20 years ago, pencil onto trace, uh, just for this, for working with a very good joiner who obsessed about how uh, a sheet of veneered MDF could meet another sheet at the corner, uh, and then making sure that wasn't the hinge point. <laughs> it was the hinge point was back here. But that's a by the by. So more importantly, it's a sort of exercise in solid and void, where we created a cube-like form and placed a cube in the in the in the slot like Shetland chair seat space where one could sit and look into the rest of the room. This is one of the generous Edinburgh South Side room. With a with an alcove big enough to put this piece of furniture in, and the rest of the room is just down here where they have. A, <clears throat> they wanted to keep using it as a sort of as a living space, um, and the bed is kind of up two steps uh, in, in the upper part of the the, the, of the void, um, with covered spaces that fall back and conceal things like TVs. Who would watch TVs in bed? Uh, and a little library space along the back edge there, sort of around the perimeter. So the perimeter is used to get to the bed, open storage, and get around to the, the shelving at the back. Um, excuse all the 18th and 19th century references, <laughs> they are heavy, um, but uh, it seemed appropriate to for a project <coughs> for Scottish canals along the Caledonian Canal uh, that goes through the Great Glen, you know, links a number of locks to get uh, that diagonal route uh, <coughs> up to Inverness. Uh, and have, it was to encourage um, tourism, active tourism up that route. And of course, tourism, and, and one reflects back on, on the Victorian attitude to tourism in Scotland, you know, popularised by the Romantic uh, painters and authors like Walter Scott. Um, um, and it is in, and so his canals wanted to encourage reinvigoration of active, they call it active tourism, you know, boat, bike, boot, I think was the catchphrase, to do your trail. You know, your challenge is still popular idea that we don't just go on holiday, sit around, we have to go on holiday and do 50k a day or whatever. <laughs> and you need a place to stay en route. And, and of course, I, well, I made, made me think of uh, Johnson and Boswell's tour of the Highlands. They went on tour, they were quite to quite a leisurely um, tour of the Highlands. And their diary is that wonderful book. That one, it depends how it's presented in by different editors, but you see one page of the diary by one by Boswell and the other page is by Johnson, and you can get editions where they're uh, uh, front and back. But um, Boswell met Johnson in a pub uh, in just right next to our office in the old town, um, which made me feel 
I'll get a bit closer to that conversation. Um, and they describe the box beds of um, well, of croft in croft houses, which uh, it seems strange to be getting romantic about something that was clearly not a not a great state of um, for those that lived in them. But uh, it was a way of keeping yourself away from the drafts in. I'm sure in a, in a in a drafty house, and uh, in, uh, this is in space side. The workers building the railway uh, through space side that's not there anymore, but they're building their their shelters from uh, the sleepers in that archetypal form of a pitch small pitch roof roof structure, just a gable left with its hearth. Um, so it's a bit out of order, but. Um, this is that route from the Great Glen that wanted to be Scottish canals manage little pieces of that chain. They don't obviously manage the locks. That's relatively wild, <laughs> but uh, the canal bits there, they have an ownership of land there. And, um, and so these are the positions where one could potentially put bothies. This was us. Uh, getting our foot in the door with Scottish canals, um, a small practice with a good client like that, it's not easy to get involved. And we pitched this suggestion. This is a very cobbled together quick image on the left back a number of years ago. So excuse the, the low quality, but um, it's really just a, a, it's a screen grab of Ben Nevis, a bit of a canal riverbank. It's not even a Scottish canal. It's not hard. Uh, and the rather immaterial uh, forms there before we'd really decided um, on what the form should be. And um, I think things are moving on, of course, with uh, hutting and that uh, legislation that makes sure that, uh, that encouraging individuals to be able to access uh, natural environments and stay overnight in in things that aren't designated as homes, but and this is but the legislation and the controls over what how you just can design a small structure uh, still reference in the building regs from today still reference the, this eighteen ninety seven act uh, as a as a as a you can reference this and, and from a design for a an overnighting spot uh, which is the tents and vans there is a is a power to um to justify the um the scale of our project um and um, so, um i think the main playful thing was to design it uh mostly as a form that could then be used for different things um, so the form it is a, a, it unashamedly designed as a as a form and we without wanting to be so willful too willful and form making we decided the only thing we would we would work with discipline of fitting two of them on a lorry uh they one could fit one behind the other and we, we have done that um they're, they're determined by the width of <coughs> transport on the road and then, and in square in plan and in, and in roof in height but we just moved the, the ridge to the diagonal rather than along the conventional pitch so um that was the only sort of design stage formal decision um uh, but it was an interesting interesting experience of learning about the weight of a structure to, to work out and all the logistics of lifting a structure uh the first ones we designed we designed with the lifting points down down here maybe this as i say it's you're thinking how daft but it seems a lot of logic to me that you lift uh thinking about loads and then you design foundations and so somehow this point seems to be significant maybe that's why we thought we put the lifting points down here and we earnestly um lifted them like this and make sure there's a rig or whatever dolly whatever they call it to lift it up and then the second time around i think this is the second time around i think we're 
You put the, uh, I spoke to a different engineer, he said, well, he, he picked his head, well, he said, oh, yeah, he said, he said, oh, those engineers, they don't know what they're doing, and he had to get a cup of coffee or something like that, and he, he said, you don't, you know, you don't lift up a cup of coffee like, like, he put his hand underneath it, and he said, you don't lift a cup of coffee like that, it's that, you, you lift, you know, you lifted it from the top edge, and I'm like, oh, yeah, that makes a lot more sense, so the second one has um, the lifting points up at the roof edge. Um, and um, well, initially it was it was initially it was used as a sort of um, as a little site office for the canals team. It wasn't used as accommodation at all. And then it was used at different, in different places, different combinations as a sort of visitor for site and put together much quicker than the official visitor centre that went up at the Kelpies. Um, uh, it was completed after we'd um, gone in and done this one. And then finally, it was um, we, we managed to put them at uh, Lag and Lock, uh, where there's a lock between two locks. Um, and uh, uh, we made them as the, the, the bothies or cabins that they were originally intended to be. Um, this is this is another project about which has a sort of similar vein, I think. I think somewhere in there's a similar vein. <laughs> Edinburgh Art Festival uh, is one of a number of festivals in Edinburgh. It does a you know, it's an amazing network of um, fringe-like venues, but it commissions one art, one project by an international art, artist every year. Um, um, and the year before we spoke to them, they just commissioned this artist who um, was interested in Dazzle, which was an idea uh, about camouflage of large object or ship boats. Uh, at, um, but only that there. So, so good, good. I get drawn to that discussion. That's not, but uh, what I want to say is the next year they, can, they commissioned an artist. Uh, um, uh, Tatsunishi, a Japanese artist uh, who had never been to Edinburgh, never been to Scotland or the UK, but was familiar with the Scott Monument, was aware of the Scott Monument, its global fame as a, as a structure um, had reached him in Japan. And um, he clearly had a, an interest in the, in, in the structure, you know, the way there's a white career of marbles statue of Walter Scott there in the stone <coughs> vault, open vault and tower of the Scott Monument. Um, <coughs> loads of, I found out loads of lovely stories about this structure of whilst involved in it and I don't want to drift too much. But Ta Tatsunishi was, was interested in, in creating um, this illusion of space around a monument. So uh, he's done this in a few places where there's a public statue of a figure. This is all before uh, all the Black Lives Matter kind of debate about public statues. It's interesting to reflect on that now with this, uh, where a statue is Victoria, obviously, uh, in Liverpool. Uh, in a public square, this is in a, in, a, in a public park in Liverpool, and he would fabricate a, it, it, so within a, so Queen Victoria's there, within a sort of stone loggia, yeah, in a public park, and he would erect a building around it, like a, hotel, a generic hotel room, um, uh, so that, and he just saw this as playful and fun, but of course, in an Edinburgh, this is in, this is Christopher Columbus in New York, um, uh, and one would reach the top of this column. Is it Washington Square? Um, and, and confront Columbus uh, at eye level. Wouldn't that? That's kind of an interesting concept, isn't it? To confront this figure uh, at eye level. Um, but in an Edinburgh context, of course, creating a a hotel room uh, is, is, is a political thing <laughs> um, you know, in a city that's kind of trying to balance its economy 
which is around towards the point. But um, so we found ourselves in the middle of um, of a big row. We were all quite fascinated by being involved in a what could you know the general row about Airbnb in the city. Um, and I thought I don't mind getting involved in this. I'm quite interested to partake in the debate or listen in at least to the debate uh, and see where it goes. So perhaps you know you can guess where this is going to go. It's not this is the project that got away, but um, the process was very interesting, and I thought I'll give it a go. And of course, Tatsu Nishi's work is temporary, and uh, there are loopholes in legislation that one one is aware of, uh, but whether one wants to exploit them or not is is an ethical question. There's, there's a, you can build a structure that exists for 30 days uh, without planning permission. Uh, how far would one push that, uh, that, that loophole, especially if it's a structure that might take at least 30 days to put together, 30 days to take apart, and one needs it there for 30 days just so that people can have an experience. It's an option because um, this was the Edinburgh Festival that relies on a relationship with the city, the council, certainly, and uh, to try and slip under the radar in such a visible place would be politically insane. Uh, so, um, but so that was off the off off the off the cards using that loophole. But what about scaffold and uh, public structures, public monuments? Well, when I arrived in Edinburgh. Uh, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, this is how the Scott Monument was first time I saw it, and it was like this for about two years, whilst um, the, the city <laughs> prevaricated over how to repair the stone. The stone leaches um, uh, oil, shale oil, from, from East, from West Lothian. It's cut from the stone where the bings are in West Lothian, and it's so the oil is seep, seeps out. The red sandstone and the soot from Waverley Valley had covers Scott Monument, and um, they put up the, the scaffold before they really knew how they were going to clean it. They would they put up a scaffold to do the re research into how to clean it, and then they found out that cleaning it would accelerate the decay or whatever. And, and it took two years to come to the decision that they would just leave it alone. Um, so uh, that. The scaffold came down and no no change. And what did Tatsunishi want to do? Well, it's quite perhaps it's quite obvious he wanted to build a, a structure enclosing Walter Scott um, that one could visit. And he, this was his brief. This is this is a this is this was a brief. Some, some, we get briefs that sort of multi-page documents, project execution plans and you know, organic grounds and uh, communication matrices or whatever, but this was this was the brief for, from Tatsu Nishi, who'd done this sketch on um, sketch on a sketch. <coughs> um, so blue is a uh, the blue is the buttressy structure of 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 Scott Monument as he saw it from his googling in Japan, and. The red is the bits he wanted an architect to help him sort out, to enclose it. So we earnestly set about working out how to do that uh, without any fixing into the grade A listed, category A listed stone structure. Um, so each of these three sided open boxes that connect into the vault were designed with uh, engineers, they now our associates with um, scaffolding structure that would pour out from the back of these uh, so that they could be held in a windy, if it was a windy August, they would, wouldn't rattle against the, the stone. So quite an engineering op operation. Of course, far too expensive. Who on earth is going to pay for this? You know, even though I think there was a back, this is back a few years, and there and there were um, challenger banks wanting to make a profile in Edinburgh, make a splash, and were prepared to splash city money uh, to stick their, their logo on it. Uh, and so we suggested a different approach. Um, 
So this was a bit controversial because we were pushing, we were trying to be helpful and pushing back, I suppose, to the artist and saying, could one build a much smaller structure that joins up the walls together rather than them all being four separate boxes that <laughs> have to be rigid. We could make one single rigid volume uh, around Sir Walter in the middle, uh, and it could be this quite nice little puzzle of a, an object within the vault, if you know what I mean. Um, and he said, well, that's, that's okay. Well, but it's far too small, Oliver, you know, uh, we need to have uh, other rooms and other spaces. Uh, and so we sort of, well, we thought, we thought, well, wouldn't that ruin the purity of that idea? We're getting obsessed with the geometry, maybe, a bit too obsessed. Um, uh, maybe we can live with houses do have annexes, do have bolt-ons, bits and pieces. And uh, we thought we would play very playfully with the idea of a house within that Walter's in, seeing as this artist clearly enjoyed the uh, the irreverence of um, and clash of a of a house of, of making domestic like spaces, um, but we still wanted to link it back to a narrative. We still couldn't quite confront the completely superficial. We wanted to link it back to the, to Walter Scott. Walter Scott has a in Waverley, his novel uh, describes the plight of Ginny Dean uh, in Edinburgh. Uh, Woman falls on hard times, you know, the classic storyline. And Ginny Dean uh, had a, was a fictional person, character, but people attributed a house in Edinburgh by Salisbury Crags, just across from Salisbury Crags, attributed a, a real house as, as her place where she lived. And people would go and get postcards uh say so they visited Judy Jean's house. This is, this is sort of the Harry Harry Potter kind of economy of Edinburgh a hundred years before. Um and we thought wouldn't it be fun to re recreate Judy Jean's home, Judy Jean's cottage around with Sir Walter Scott within it. <laughs> um just a fun bonkers idea to have. Um, yeah, yeah, and of, um, we did earnestly sit down with the planners a couple of times and we had polite conversations, tried to push it without anyone losing their temper. Uh, um, but it was a, what's that word they use in America? Filibustery, isn't it? Where if you want something, to, if you want to kill something <coughs> off, you just kill it off with time. And if, uh, if you delay decision-making long enough, there's no window to, to to make uh, a, a real decision in time. Um, so um, it couldn't possibly have been built for that festival. The funders uh, wanted it for the festival. If it, if it slipped, it just got its kill off. Never mind. Um, so those are small, small projects. Uh, I just wanted to just talk about the Eggshed project because I mean, it's not like we really make any great income from small projects and this one we made a modest income from a slightly larger project like the egg shed um you know it's um of course the reality of us of our practice four person practices we do do projects we're proud of them all um they're diverse from social housing um we work with as i say Community-led projects that are that, that, that are do wash their face. That's a good expression. Washing its face and and, and working with um, good funders like um, mostly public sector funding projects. But um, and this one is public, largely public sector funded. Um, in a lovely part of Scotland, uh, it's it is for Scottish Canal. So Scottish Canals took a leap of faith with our little cabins commission. Um, and then we ended up uh, doing a good job and we got on their framework, um, which meant that lots of other projects came our way, including community engagement events uh, and consultations. So we did a, a, an extensive five day um, series of charrettes, as they're called, you know, uh, co designing in, in, in multiple venues um, uh, ideas um, with, 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 local, with local stakeholders. Um, around the Crinan Canal, um, 
Uh, yeah, so here it is, if you have notes, I'm sure. Crinan is the obvious, uh, obvious beauty spot at the, uh, the, at the West End, and that amazing relationship with the, the water and the controlled managed edge of the canal going into the more and more. I'm just that image, but um, our drishig at the other end is slightly, it's still got charm, but it's not, it's not as obviously beautiful as Crinan, but um, it needed a bit more of a helping hand. Uh, so uh, it used to be uh, the harbour where um, the steamers from the Clyde would come and drop off tourism, paying passengers for, I think, what, well, day tripping even? I think the day trippers would come. I think you come, you come and go through what's called Pierce Square. There's a series of, 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 of stone buildings uh, where you want to get a ticket to go onto the a boat on the canal and take her on the canal to Crinan and you see Crinan come back onto the steamer and back home. Um, but it's also a working harbour and goods and would be deposited on the, the space just there beyond the on the boat there um and some of the i think um ballast and other things waste was built up and it's a pile of muck would emerge a bit of land out of the out of the lock side there uh and a structure was eventually built on it um which 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 was stored dairy produce the hence the egg shed name was selected but it was used for different things as well as storing dairy and just seeing it over the years emerging as a as a site, it didn't. It really was just the the, 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 the seabed. But over the years, it established as a as a as a slightly raised piece of land. Um, yeah, it's quite vulnerable. This I, I, this this whole side of the high street disappears. Um, that's 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 it starting to disappear. I don't know, the other way around. It does disappear in the mid twentieth century. Yes, it does disappear. <laughs> yeah, as you can see here, uh, it's lost its whole half of its high street. It's all sad. And um, one's not aware of the hardly aware of the canal when one's down here going off to say um, Tarbert. Uh, People come through here and are not aware of the canal network starting here so much. Um, it really, it really, really got buggered about with. I mean, it's not just urban sites that are, are used to have contamination problems. Uh, you know, they need cleaning up. This is um, the land being you know by canal, sort of canal, a public resource was requisitioned by the Ministry of Defence. Uh, the Second World War um, and a place for fuel storage. There were three very large cylinders sitting on here, uh, removed about 15 years ago, and have a legacy of spillage into here. Um, it was then used by a private company as cleaner oils, um, part of Shell, I think. Um, so, a real, real problem for. Here's the heritage. Here's the, here's the um, Pierce Square. This is the custom house. There's a nice harbour master's house in the top of the floor of this. There's a nice heritage opportunity here. And a working harbour where timber from Argyle is taken off the road and onto boats. Uh, and a working boat yard and slip and a community boat yard. Lots of fun activities. And a nice, it across a nice irregular, started an irregular pattern. No, no sort of buildings against streets here. This is a, I don't know if you know what your favorite port town is, but I think of Malague and then um, it's the irregular distribution of buildings there. Um, this is the, this is the egg shed as it was uh, across that space where the big drums of oil were uh, and these tanks, which we we're very glad. I think it made a huge impact was just removing those that legacy of tanks. But um, those levels were still, were still a legacy, legacy problem. The levels are not are made ground. This is not stable ground behind this. This is just the, the wall, the harbour wall um, of, of gas methane bubbling out from <laughs> that infill. 
this being down at a flood level, clearly this is getting hit by sea levels. There's no listing or protection on this project, but why on earth are we trying to keep it? <laughs> uh, why on earth are we trying to build there, you might say, just to, to try and um, build some confidence and build some, start the cleanup process. So a um, bit of a flicker. Um, our approach was to, was, a, uh, was, to, was, to, was to sort of measure, to show a measurement of the change, certainly the sort of in, in section of the lifting of the ground and the new volume within the, um, the old structure. So uh, so like a little bit of a barometer uh, of change, certainly our new in, in old kind of approach there. And our new is substantially bigger than the existing. So we treat the excess as a sort of form moored up against the other building. Well, more, you know, one often says, yeah, one often says, oh, it's like two forms moored up against each other. It seems a bit, almost a bit too direct to reference to when, you know, when it's actually in a coastal environment, one which could be cheesy. But um, yeah. What would I say? Yes, you can see we started to articulate and change the top edge profile of the wall there. I did used to work for Richard Murphy Architects, so it can get a bit of, he does like to manipulate the edges of old things and repair them before one puts the, uh, the new inside. I try to, try to move my, my own stuff on a bit, but that's quite obviously a reference there. Um, yeah, that's this is sort of just say to this, it's quite interesting not to be really involved with a street building that's more involved with the water's edge. This is the low tide. I regret not putting the tide that the water here up as it is in high tide, which is up against that sort of staggered edge there. Uh, it really does see, really does hit our building. Just to show you, it's how it's organized. It's, it's very much two parts if you two uses, uh, but they can work together. Uh, and this is a bit over bright, isn't it? How do I point? I don't know. Um, it's quite obvious, really, isn't it? Uh, there's two entrances. There's, 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 there's the, um, which is often a problem, isn't it? <laughs> in Belgium, you want to one. This is quite useful because one is a, a community access, community use here. With, um, and toilets and losing things are quite close there. And the other rectangular form is uh, <coughs> heritage, is sort of heritage interpretation of a natural landscape environment and the built heritage, the engineering of the Canoon Canal, you can learn about that. And you can buy so it's a commercial space as well. Um, and it's got um, it's got staff facilities at the back in that last square at the back there, and between them is this sort of aisle uh, which is heavily glazed, uh, 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 which I wish I could show you the plan because you can it forms a little a little route between exhibition cases, so you can curate a sort of timeline or whatever uh, as you walk through those through that down the aisle, so to speak. Um, but I mean, it's, it, it has a sliding door, but I can't really see it. No. Uh, it can close off the community space from the from the, the shop museum, so you're not tempted to drift. You know, out of hours to drift one between the other, but they can with that you can manage the access to the rooms. Preach. I just thought I'd show you some of those. Shifts in section, the red line is the existing uh, building up to the blue line, which is the SEPA designated one in 200 year flood level. Uh, and then the dotted blue line is called what they call the flood resistance level. So it's for it's at the further margin on top of that uh, for surges. Uh, for those spring storms and those, those tidal effect of them. Um, um, uh, 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 yeah. So, so everything below that line is dotted blue line is treated in flood as, as a sort of basin like quality. So it's all flood resistant material. So it's an excuse for us to sort of give a, uh, a base that is 
like a, a concrete like base. And, if, and then we're relieved of that obligation above the line and we do things in timber above that line. So we, we really went to the wire on that datum. Um, it's a bit more extreme in the existing building, yeah, a bit more infill to bring the level up. Um, and that pushes the, the new build just that bit out of the, the shell of the old. So I thought I'd show these during construction. You can really see the, uh, the datum level of the basin like base. Uh, and um, we really made it hard for ourselves, for the contractor, by, by requiring, wanting, requiring these different forms of construction. Um, so, yes, we've got a mixture here. <laughs> Of uh, concrete that's uh, well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, and all sorts of membranes to deal with the gas, the ground gas, and make sure it's <laughs> ventilated underneath. From underneath, we've got concrete and concrete block for this flood resistance zone. Uh, then we've got a uh, affordable timber frame uh, around about, and then we want to we wanted to express timber, our timber in, in, in the roof and make that visible. Uh, in the brief structure, obviously this is, you know, uh, so, but, uh, and of course, when you're putting timber frame inside an existing structure, you're doing things in, 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 in reverse in terms of like sequence, you know, one, one normally puts the, the outside of a surface on, so we're offering, a, offering the, it is a structural, it is a structural leaf, this, this, this these panels, why are you suffering? Um, yeah, so yes, it's, it, it, you just have to rethink uh, the sequence of building things and how to get into to that membrane uh, when you're, you've got a stone wall in the way. Um, um, and so the various conditions through the height, through the section there. In fact, this is actually through. A, there are parts of the building which have regular ceilings and they have basic roof trusses in. You can just see them at the top there. Not all of it is Douglas fir. Uh, it's only we use the Douglas fir open voids where it makes has an impact, you know, over the community space, over the exhibition space. Elsewhere, over the loos, it's it's um, it's roof trusses. Um, and then you can see. Uh, the ventilated void between the, the masonry wall and the timber frame. Yeah. When you can't see it, it's, it's quite it's, it's quite techy in engineers' territories. How this is the we didn't use this structure for the load. Uh, wasn't trusted, uh, or uh, we wanted we wanted I mean, we definitely wanted the, the the impression of a building within a building. So below here is a system of um, micro piles. I think it was they called. Uh, couldn't get a pile driver into the enclosure of the structure, so they had a special micro bore or something that could much more closer centered. Anyway, there's, there's all sorts of different technologies involved in in this to do to do different jobs in different places. <laughs> um, yeah, and you can actually quite apparent the um, these two forms. The, the new bill form, the new cell unified, we try to uh, combine with the single material coating the whole thing with a bind to cut out of the entrance. This space here is really quite popular. Um, it's got a great view over this gaming wall to the, the stacked piles of timber there, and you can watch the um, the boats lifting the timber. People like watching other people working. <laughs> Realised this. Uh, we thought um, in the Charettes, we thought early day, early doors, we thought uh, we thought it would be health and safety. We thought all people would be totally concerned about the health and safety of back and reversing lorries and, and public and tourists. Da, da, da. And they thought everyone was like, no, it's a, people love going to watch other people doing their, doing their day. They, they were lifting things and moving things around. So that's a great place to watch that. But it's also a, a sheltered, it's quite a sheltered outdoor space. It's a group to the community 
Anna, the product target said, was telling me she was there last and they had marked out a, a grid of two meter crosses at two meters here and they were doing their Pilates class instead of in, in the in the uh, in the space they were doing it outside on the on the little courtyard. It's quite fun. It's, uh, that's the view out at the end of the aisle. Yeah, that's the gabby and there's the rocks beyond, rather foreshortened. And there's a lovely um, lighthouse at the end of the um, water break. And this is before they, they fitted out with the artifacts from the exhibition. That's the the aisle. You go in one end and. It's rather, it's controlled, you know, don't want, in the sense that it allows a curator to, to tell a story. It's, it's only to a short, brief walk down, down the aisle, so to speak, um, to get the story. But people really, uh, local folk, folk, folk really adopt, adopted it and felt they could entrust canals with artifacts that they had in their family, family from their attics or whatever. Yeah, I think, you know, from, from their, family who might have worked on the canals and someone's um, hole punch from the taking the tickets at the at the pier square um which had, since they would donate or lend the collection so there's a real collection of local locally owned and adopted artifacts yeah. yes the articulation of the, the wall edge the, the raising of the sea wall so that flood resistance level is kind of Flying through there, so there's a datum really kind of on the edge there. And that's that's us in um, just finishing up the that's our office in or in and to Mary Street, just down from the one mile. So. If you're in, if you're in Edinburgh, you're very welcome to come and say hello. We must be not well. There's usually one or two people now. For some of us, still work remotely, and, but uh, usually I'll see someone in. If you're passing, that'd be nice to see you. Okay. <laughs>